Activist Beth Ann Hardison became a trailblazing force in the fashion world by pushing for increased diversity. Now, the former model and agent tells people about what it was like at first to speak out. When I first did the very first press conference, you know, the room was full. It was standing room only. Uh, I knew it was necessary to do at that time because I had waited like a few years before I could get myself going. Um, the reaction was immediately, it was, it, it was obvious. I mean, I was, it wasn't like I was on to something, but I was on to something, you know, it was just actually true that it was, it was a reality. Uh, the fact that I was trying to help everyone, you know, come together, get along, quote unquote, um, was obvious. So the press picked up on it right away. So the Guardian, the, our trade paper, Women's Wear Daily, the New York Times, everyone started to write about it and question, is there racism in, in the industry? Um, and so... It was a it was a support a reaction. In the beginning, like in the commercial advertising industry, yes, that was in the 90s. So we helped to sort of help to shift that. Um, and then you start to see uh, more people of color representing products, commercial products on television. When it was time for the fashion models to start disappearing because of the the activity in uh, Eastern Europe. Then, and, and scouts being able to go to Eastern Europe and scout the models and mod bringing models to America. That changed rapidly, and it was a need to actually do something about that. I'm gonna start out with the, what I call my 10 pet peeves with, the, with my industry. This is number one. Oftentimes, image makers having the eye or not having the eye to determine black beauty. Beth Ann's new documentary, Invisible Beauty, highlights her work to create better representation in the fashion industry. By the time uh, 2007 came out, I already gone to Mexico, cooled out, laid in the hammock, you know. But when I came back to, to, to sort this all this thing out, yes, they were saying at that point, no blacks, no ethnics. And it was basically because we do, we do uh, speak very clearly in our industry because it's a physical industry. So you have to say clearly, no blondes, no redheads, no freckles, no that. You, you have to, to indicate, that's how you cast. Some people find it very offensive who are outside of our industry. But in, if you're within the industry, it's not offensive to say, we're not using blacks, we don't want a black girl, we don't want a Latino, we don't want blondes, please, no blondes. You know, these things are said. But this became no blacks, no ethics, but it went one season, two seasons, three seasons. And it was affecting the industry, it was affecting the uh, model agencies because then they have to say to the few girls they have because now they have no market for them. So the few girls that they have, they have to keep saying to them, I'm sorry, and they're just seeing black girls this season. And they were doing it in Europe too. You know, they were just not seeing black girls this season. Uh, I'm sorry, we're not seeing dark girls this season like that. It became a norm. That becomes dangerous. You can do it once, you can do it twice. You start doing two and three, four, five times. Here I come. But they force people to have tough conversations in order to create real change. The last thing they would ever imagine that they would want to be associated to is racism. Um, and as I would say, I was very thoughtful how I worded it. It was really basically, if you continue to use one model or two season after season, the result is, whether you like it or not, no matter the intention, the result is racism. And for someone to hear that who's a creative person, who's so ignorant of the fact that what they're doing, because they're just following the yellow brick road, they're just following a trend that now has turned in from a trend of a, of an, a season or two to now years. They went years. That's, you know, you gotta help them. Because I believe in my heart, I have to believe that that's not their intention. Look at the greatness of someone like Tyson Beckford with Ralph Lauren, it's major. Everything was happening then. Hip hop was happening then. You know, street culture was happening then. I mean, there were designers way before, like Willie Smith and Stephen Burroughs. You know, you know, uh, so many designers that did so well uh, back in the day. But then things change, and then you have to, you know, remind people if you're an elder, especially if you're an elder, you have to remind people that we've been here before. You know, this is not brand new. Don't fall back. Don't go backwards. If anything, just keep going forward. And you just have to nicely embarrassed them back into position. Now, Beth Ann couldn't be more proud of the work she's done and the legacy she'll leave behind. I'm inspired by me. I, I honestly have to say that. So I'm just happy to see that my life allows me to have more opportunity and more breath of air. 
that I am and that I still keep thinking, I got an idea. I want to do this someone and give the wisdom. So I think it's a, more importantly than anything is to be able to have to, yeah, everyone doesn't come on earth with wisdom. This is for fact. We know that. And if you have a bit of sense of sageness, I like to share that. And that's what I think is what I, I long to do, but I'm happy that if you live long enough and you can, if you contribute enough things on earth, then people have no choice but to look back and recognize because it's not that many people who are doing something like you. For more with Beth Ann Hardison, pick up this week's issue of People on Newsstands Friday.